Doug, we appreciate your uh, selections tonight. Uh, how long has it been since you sang that song? It's been a long, <laughs> long time for me. I used to know all the words to it. It's a very beautiful song, and certainly it is something that all of us ought to be doing. It's throwing out the lifeline to a brother who may be sinking, and he may be sinking in his grief. You know, grief is a horrible thing, isn't it? It's hard for us to grieve. We're going to talk about grief not only tonight, but we're going to talk about it next Sunday night. Uh, someone mentioned the other day about my 10-point sermon. I think it was Ben Rohn. So to accommodate Ben, we're going to have five points tonight, and then next Sunday night, we're going to give you the other five points. It is a little bit lengthy lesson, but it is something that we need to deal with. I think a lot of people don't know how to treat grief. Is it wrong? Is it really? And, uh, you know, the common problem of grief is so evident, isn't it? Every day we read in the newspaper or maybe you get an email from the uh, funeral homes in town telling you that a certain individual had passed from this life. Uh, it may be something even closer to you. It could be maybe a mate, your husband, your wife, a child. It could be a cousin. It could be your mother. It could be your father your aunt, your uncle, just a real close friend. And how do you deal with grief? I believe there's a right way to deal with it, and there is a wrong way to deal with grief. Now, sometimes people say, well, you know, I just don't know that we ought to be grieving. And most of the time, if someone is grieving, uh, probably sometimes some of the most challenging words and kind words we speak to someone, but they may not necessarily be the things that we ought to be saying, is, I know how you feel. And most of the time, we don't know how they feel. Uh, if you've never lost a loved one, if you've never lost a child, if you've never lost a, a mate, or perhaps your parents, then you really don't know how people feel at that moment. But uh, I want us to uh, think tonight a little bit closer on this subject of grief because it is something that can either hold you down or it is something that can propel you into the future to deal with it. Matter of fact, in the Old Testament, there is a book of Lamentations. Anybody in here ever read in the book of Lamentation? Uh, some of you have. The book of Lamentations actually is a book uh, written by Jeremiah, the great prophet of old. He actually wrote two books in the Old Testament. One of them was the one that bears his name. Uh, it is called the book of Jeremiah, where he gives prophetic utterances about uh, the future and things that are going to happen, as well as uh, perhaps voicing his concern. And even his tears over all the things that were going on in his native land. The book of Lamentation actually is a book that teaches us how to grieve. We have all been there, and I know that uh, as I speak tonight, all of you that are sitting in this auditorium have been touched by grief in some way or another. You have grieved. You have shed tears. Uh, and, you know, the Bible does say, however, that weeping may endure for a night, but joy will come in the morning. You know, when you think about grief, you have to think about the fact, and of course people always ask, is it biblical and why don't you get over grief? Grief takes a long time for us to deal with it and to comprehend and understand how we deal with it. But, you know, to answer the question, is it wrong, we know it's not wrong. If it were wrong, then God would have sinned. But God did not sin. And in the book of Genesis 6, verse 5 and 6, the Bible says, The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. Now notice this very next verse. And the Lord was grieved. You mean God was grieved? He was grieved that he had made man on the earth and his heart was filled with pain. Does God have a heart? Absolutely. Is it like ours? No. 
but he does have a heart and he could be touched by the, but the Bible says of Jesus that he could be touched by the infirmities of the flesh. He could suffer pain and anguish and even emotional trauma. And when we lose a loved one in death, it is traumatizing to say the least. I remember uh, actually experiencing grief for the first time when my mom died. I was 12 years old. And, and it was a very traumatic moment uh, when she died. And it took me a long time to really get over it. And I asked basically the same questions that most people ask. Why did this happen? You know, why, God, why did God do this to me? Why did he allow my mother to die at age 51? Why? And it was so hard for me to really come to grips with it. And through the years, uh, to be with my siblings when their mates died, and even them. There were seven of us children. I'm the only one left. And I've spoken at the memorial services of all of my brothers and sisters, with the exception of one older brother who lived in Boston. And at the time, COVID was going on. I didn't, you know, you couldn't get a flight out anywhere. And, uh, but I did grieve over it. Uh, you know, when we grieve, there are many precious moments and memories that come to our mind. But not only did God get grieved, the Bible tells us that Jesus himself was grieved. One of the shortest passages in the Bible is found in the book of John, the 11th chapter. Jesus had been summoned to the bedside of his dear friend, Lazarus. And it appeared that he was going to die, and Mary and Martha had sent word for Christ to come. But he delayed his coming, and we know later in the, in the story, uh, is that the reason he did that is the fact that he wanted the works of God to be made manifest. That he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead should he die. And that's exactly what he did. But the Bible says that when he got to that little community of Bethany, he saw them weeping, and the Bible says that Jesus wept. You know what it is to weep? It's, not, it's, it's more than cry. It's a more in-depth, intense feeling of grief when someone weeps. It was like Mary who wept at the tomb of Jesus. You remember when they went to the tomb to anoint the body of Christ and she had mistaken Jesus who has already been raised from the dead, but she had mistaken him as the gardener for he said, woman, why weepest thou? And she said, because they have taken away my Lord. Well, Jesus wept, but not only did he weep, but did you know that the Holy Spirit can be grieved as well? So we have the whole Godhead, don't we? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, who can be grieved. Now, the Greek word translated grieve in the book of Ephesians 4 and verse 30 means actually to cause to feel sorrow, pain, unhappiness, and distress. And there's plenty of it in this life. That's why Jesus, when uh, he commissioned John to write the book of Revelation and the Holy Spirit, tells us that this great place that we call heaven is a place where there'll be no grief, there'll be no weeping, there'll be no more death, no sorrow, nor crying. We won't be weeping in heaven, but we will be living an exhilarating life. In that passage, the Bible tells us how we grieve the Holy Spirit. If you look in Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Now, he says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit whereby you have been sealed unto the day of redemption. In verse 30. Now, we know that those are things that can cause the Holy Spirit uh, to be grieved. But we know that God blesses us, those of us who mourn, for Matthew 5 and verse 8. Uh, he says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. 
Now there's some facts about grief and grieving that you need to know. One reason, and I really believe this, that we, we find grieving so difficult for us and people bottle themselves up with their grief. I was talking with an individual this afternoon who's going through a tremendous trauma in her life. And she said, you know, I've not been able to cry with anyone except you. And you're the only one that I feel that is really a confidant and that I can talk to and I can let myself down and I can grieve over what's going on. And, and I said, I understand exactly how you feel. But sometimes when we grieve, we don't know what to expect. Have you gone through any of the following? I don't, I don't know if you can see this real well up here, but a survey was made and about 32% experienced the death of a family member or a close friend, uh, maybe excluding a child or, or perhaps your mate, so to say. 29% suffered the loss of a friendship or a relationship family members, serious illness, or diagnosis of a chronic health condition, 23%, the death of your pet, what about that one? Or your, your own serious illness, you have been diagnosed maybe with cancer, or heart disease, things of that nature, 15%. The point I'm trying to make is this, is that we are going to experience grief. The loss of your job, the loss of all of your possessions, maybe a fire uh, burned your house down, maybe it was a divorce that caused the problem, or then the death of a spouse, or the death of a child, which is so abnormal because the normality is that your child would outlive you, but it doesn't always work that way. And we know there's certainly biblical examples in the Word of God uh, where children died before their parents. Remember the widow at Nain when her son died? Listen to these points, and like I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you with uh, five points tonight, and I hope you'll take these and digest them, and next Sunday night we'll deal with the other five. First of all, grief is normal. Don't think that you're a misfit. Don't feel that, you know, I shouldn't be having to deal with this because, you know, uh, this is just not normal. Grief is normal. Now, you may not cry, but you can still grieve within. Grief is like the ocean. It comes in on waves actually ebbing and flowing, and sometimes the water is calm, and sometimes it is so overwhelming, all we can do is learn to swim, and how true that is. Sometimes special days will trigger an emotional response to, in, in terms of grief. Maybe your wedding day, you've lost your mate, and you remember with great fondness the moment you stood before the preacher, and he asked you to pledge yourself to your mate, or perhaps maybe uh, you were baptized and you remember that moment and your mom and dad were there with you. And I mean, it could just actually be a number of things. Grief is not a disease. It is the normal hu human response to a significant loss. Matter of fact, I would, I would just really feel that it would be ab abnormal if people did not grieve. People may encourage you to be strong, and we, we don't know what to say. We don't. And I think maybe that's why Job's three friends just sat for a long time, about a week waiting, and not saying a blooming thing. They didn't know what to say. What do you say to someone? What do you say? Sometimes it's not what you say. It's what you do, that you are present with them. You are going through this trauma that they are having to experience. But to say, do not cry. Someone told me one time, a college professor, and he said, you know, tears are the very things that God gave us to flush and wash the emotions. And it is true. But how sad it would be if someone that we cared about died and we didn't cry or we didn't carry on as, as if something traumatic happened. Our grief is saying that we miss the person, that individual. We love them. 
and we're struggling to adjust life without that special relationship. And that's where a lot of us are. And that's where we have to lean upon one another and lean upon God. You're not crazy. You're not weak. Just because maybe you're having a tough time handling it, folks, doesn't mean that you're abnormal. You're experiencing grief, and after a significant loss, that is a normal, normal reaction. Secondly, the worst kind of grief is our own, isn't it? It is. A loss is a very personal matter. We all experience that. Your loss seems like the worst possible thing in the world that could have happened to you. Sometimes people ask if it is more difficult to lose a spouse or to lose a child. Let me just, just ask you a question tonight. How many of you think it is more traumatic to lose uh, a mate? Raise your hand. How many of you think it is worse to lose a child? More hands went up. You see where the husbands are. No. No, I understand that. I understand exactly. Your offspring. And when they die, like I said, that is not the normal routine of things, is it? Other people question if it is worse to lose someone after a long, lingering illness or if they die suddenly. I won't ask that question tonight. And unexpectedly from a heart attack or in an accident. I spoke at a memorial service yesterday for a dear friend of mine, one of the very first people that I met when I came to Palestine, uh, Arvis Walden. And uh, anyway, uh, Arvis was a wonderful fellow, but he died in his sleep. Uh, I assume he had a heart attack. I don't really know. And uh, But uh, anyway, some people say, well, that's the way I want to go. I don't want to go with one of the lingering illnesses. Someone told me one time, they said, and I was asking him, I said, how would you like to go? And he said, well, I'd, I'd like to have a heart attack and go like that. And the other one said, not me. He said, boy, I'd rather have one of these lingering illnesses and, and to give me time to say goodbye to everybody and then go. And they came to the third guy and they said, well, how would you like to go? He said, I'd like to have one of those lingering illnesses also. And then for them to say, I think he's doing better. <laughs> Nobody wants to die but everybody wants to go to heaven. Number three, the way out of grief is through it, through grief. We have to work through it. You know, when David wrote the book of Psalms, and primarily most of them, Asaph wrote some of them, but uh, when you read the 23rd Psalm, you find David saying, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You walk through that valley and the shadow of the very thing that grieves you. And the way out of grief is to walk through it. Grief has no deadlines. In other words, you don't grieve for a while and say, well, you can't, I can't grieve anymore. Uh, somebody would think that, you know, I'm a misfit if I grieve over it after a year. There's, listen. Sometimes it does take years, and some you may never get over. You may grieve all of your life, <clears throat> but we learn to live with grief rather than get over it. Yea, though I walk through the valley, through the valley of the shadow of death. You know, the great comfort that I have and uh, certainly having lost both parents and all of my siblings, uh, I have learned to deal with it. There's still those moments when I experience uh, heartfelt grief over their departure from this life. But I have learned to trust in God and to realize that uh, they're in the hands of one who is much, much stronger and one who is much more loving one who is much more caring and one who understands grief better than I. Grief is painful. Loss is one of the most difficult human experiences. We may try to avoid the pain and sometimes we try and the more ways we search for ways to do it, the more elusive it actually becomes. We may attempt to get over it as quickly as possible 
but most often it simply just does not work out that way. It doesn't. What we have to do is when we are thinking about it and when it just absorbs our very mental capabilities, I don't think God wants that to happen. I think he wants us to try to, to work on it. And I think that's why David said, you know, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Uh, the joy should supersede the grief in knowing where our loved ones are. And you know what? One, one of my uh, uh, feelings here is just about something, and it's just a very personal thing to me. Sometimes we say, I'm sorry for your loss. <laughs> And you know, in reality, if a person is a Christian, he has gone to be with God, and it is not a loss. It is a gain. That's what Paul said. He said, for me to die is gain, and it is. Helen Keller made this statement. The only way to get to the other side is to go through the door. And we have to walk through that door of grief at times. We need to find the courage to go through it. And uh, this experience of grief that we call, uh, you know, it's just a horrible, horrible thing. But learning this is a major key to recovery. I, I think about my loved ones who have departed. And one of the things I think about that gives me solace and comfort is the fact that I know they would not want me to spend the rest of my life weeping over their death, over their departure. But they would want me to live life to the fullest. Grief has several stages, actually, and I just kind of list a little overview here a minute. Sometimes we experience what we call shock and denial, especially if someone dies what we would say prematurely, or if someone dies, uh, maybe with a heart attack and they just fall over, then it's kind of a shock and denial. I had no idea they had any kind of problems going on. And we start denying it in our mind. We just can't believe. It's disbelief. Uh, actually, it, and some people just go back to tending to business as usual, or they return to the normal. But sometimes people find it very difficult to do that. But life does go on. And then there is that feeling of anger and depression that we go through in life. We get bitter and we get resentful. Uh, I've seen wives, and I've had that happen, tell me, you know, why did he leave me here like this? Why did he go before me? I wanted us to go together. And then they start asking why. And guilt, and they start blaming themselves for their mate's death. And then they experience what we call a, a loss of faith. We are shaken to the hilt because of what has happened. And then there is that release and honor. The idea that there can be an emotional release. Uh, and I'm going to tell you something. Crying and weeping helps us to overcome our grief. And there is nothing wrong with experiencing it. We start honoring the life of the departed. Uh, you know, we've had through the years a lot of people that would remember their loved ones in different ways. Um, maybe by giving song books, what we did at that time before we started singing with uh, PowerPoint. Uh, I think Don Bell maybe is who it was or someone who had given song books. Actually, maybe it was Courtney who gave them in honor of Don. I'm not real sure, but I know people do that. Or people purchase items and, and uh, for the church, and we have a label on it identifying uh, the deceased. And so anyway, we want to honor the departed. And then there's that sense of peace over a period of time that will begin to settle in, and it becomes more bearable. And then there is the return to love. You start having loving thoughts and feelings regarding the departed or feelings of love for the living or accepting and enjoying life once again. Life goes on after death, folks. And there's nothing wrong with people who get over their grief quicker than others. But fourthly, your grief is intimately connected to the relationship. 
However close your relationship is, the more you're going to grieve. It's just going to happen. We may grieve the loss of a parent differently from the loss of a friend. Each made a different contribution actually to our lives. And what we lost is not the same. And so we grieve differently. We do. In the book of Psalms 18 and verse 2, David captured it in these words, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God, he is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield. He says, the horn of my salvation and my stronghold. Wow, that says it, doesn't it? David said in Psalm 77, 1, I cry out to God, I cry out aloud unto God, and he will hear me. You know, Jesus did not rebuke Mary and Martha when they were weeping over the death of their brother. They didn't rebuke him. Factually, the Bible said, you know what he did? That was where he wept. And isn't that parallel to what Paul teaches in the book of Romans chapter 12? When he says, we are to weep with them that weep. Don't pat them on the back and say, don't weep. Maybe words like, I'm here for you. And we will work through this together. But last of all here, grief is hard work. And we all need God. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in their spirit. Psalms 34 and verse 18. Isn't that a comforting thought to know that God is going to be with a brokenhearted? 2 Corinthians 1 verse 3 and 4. Why does God comfort us? This may surprise you. He said, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all of our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. God didn't make us comfortable just to be comforted, but he comforts us that we may comfort others. Now that's what the Apostle Paul says. And sometimes, you know, it, it, it amazes me when we have funerals. Uh, you know, sometimes people never take note of a brother or a sister in Christ who dies. We think someone else is going to show up. I think that's when we can be there for our brother and sister in Christ. We ought to be there for them to the very best of our ability. There are some things that certainly keep you from doing that. But sometimes going to funerals is a thing of the past. But it's the very thing that we ought to think about, folks. And to be mindful of the hurt that other people are experiencing. And as I said, it's not so much what you say. It's just being there. Embracing those people. A grief response is often referred to as grief work. That's what they call it. It requires more energy to work through than most people actually expect. It takes a toll on us physically and emotionally, and it really does. I'm telling you, grief can make you sick at your stomach. This is why we often feel so fatigued after the death or the departure of one that we feel so close to. For no one is cast off by the Lord forever. Though he brings grief, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love, for he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to anyone. And those are the words from that book of Lamentation I mentioned to you in the words of Jeremiah in the third chapter, 31 through 33. And the problem is often compounded by people's expectation of us to be strong or pull ourselves together and to get on with life. I'd like to tell you that's perhaps maybe what we ought to do in some ways, but it's not what we do. And it's not an easy thing. Grief is a horrible thing. 
But I know that even in our moments of grief that God is there with us. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I am there with you. And to that end, we're comforted. I hope you're comforted tonight by these words that the God has given unto us. Next Sunday night, we're going to complete that study on grief. There are five other additional points that are so very, very important, and I hope that you're here then. If you have a special need or a prayer request tonight you'd like to bring before the Lord's church or before God, then now's the time to do that. Or if you'd like to be bathed in the blood of Jesus Christ our Lord in the act of baptism, then the invitation of our Lord is yours while we stand and while we sing.